I'm Sarah Calvo. I've known Manoli since he was a grad student, and I wanted to talk to you, thinking about the meaning of life, two of the main questions that come to mind are, uh, why are we here and how did we get here? And I think evolution very clearly answers how did we get here from single cells to complex cells all the way to I'm a particular person. But something that I've found extremely unsatisfying as an atheist is any explanation of how life starts at the beginning. Because you have to have something before you can have substrate to do evolution. And I don't know about you, but I remember distinctly learning in high school about primordial soup. Who here learned about life coming up out of primordial soup? And I have a vivid memory of the artist rendition of this moment of life. There was a picture of a puddle on a volcanic background with some volcanoes in the background um, and some electricity. And so this as a theory of how life comes to be has so many holes, it's like more holes than cheese. And this was very unsatisfying to me as a high school student. And now it was unsatisfying to me as a biologist. I study metabolism, the exact biochemical processes, how uh, cells break down um, nutrients, how they combine them to make new things, how they get energy. and. Uh, it, I use evolution every day as a tool to understand how life actually works, going from billions of years of evolution, the very simplest archaeal and bacterial cells to complex eukaryotic cells. And I'm st was still very unsatisfied, having no good explanation of how life could have ever started in the beginning. Until about two years ago, I read a book that blew my mind a little bit, and I wanted to share some of the insights that, for the first time, give a plausible explanation of how we all came to be. And it has implications for how common life might be in the universe, if it's true. It's a theory we don't know, but it seems plausible from my knowledge of biology. So the primordial soup concept came from these amazing experiments done in the 50s by Harold Urey and Stanley Miller. They took a chamber, they filled it with chem um, atoms that they thought were common on the early Earth. They zapped it with high electricity to simulate um, electricity, and bam, you get not only organic compounds, you get exactly some of the amino acids that are in every form of life today. So that's where this initial idea of primordial soup came from. But as all of you are probably thinking, this doesn't make much sense. Uh, there are two huge problems with a theory of how you go from that to life. Well, two of them are concentration and thermodynamics. So in terms of concentration, there's no way you could possibly have a little puddle where life is happening on the early Earth. It's just not stable enough for tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years to have a concentration of molecules in a small puddle over hundreds of thousands of years. Even if it was like a spring of a sulfurous bubbling spring, the Earth isn't stable enough to have that sort of environment for hundreds of thousands of years. But you had lots of oceans, but if how do you get the enough concentration of your organic molecules in the ocean without it just floating away. The other problem is even if you had concentration, say you had a can of Campbell's soup, tons of organic nutrients sitting there, or a jar of peanut butter, lots of great stuff. If you sat that around for a couple billion years, do you think you're going to get life? No way. There's no energy source. It's not going to happen. Even if you zap it with um, lightning every 10 minutes, things are going to break down. You're not going to get life. Um, so. Uh, you need both concentration and um, energy and thermodynamically favorable uh, 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 situation, and it has to be stable. So along comes this theory that's been developed over many different people. It's not my work. I'm just awed by it, and it seems plausible for the first time. And this theory posits that life evolved in the early oceans at undersea vents. Now, you're probably thinking of these hot smoker uh, deep sea vents that are down at the bottom of the ocean floor, where um, under tremendous pressure, you have water at 400 degrees centigrade coming out, these billows of black smoke. And this is there's huge life there now. There are these six foot uh, worms and clams bigger than your head. Those are not the deep sea vents I'm talking about. They are very unstable, and they are so hot that if you developed organic molecules, they would tend to break down pretty quickly. Most of our life is not uh, forms that we know about. They can ex we can 
see life at extremes, but you have to, they're very specific adaptations for those. So those black smokers are not what I'm talking about. More recently, they discovered these other kind of undersea vents called alkaline hydrothermal vents. And these are beautiful. They're these white towers that are um, bubbling up with hydrogen or hydrogen sulfide bubbling up. And they are not, um, there's some distance from volcanic activity. Specifically, if you have uh, two plates that are separating, like the Atlantic Ridge, um, when the plates separate, you get a crack. It fills with huge amounts of seawater that goes into the Earth's crust and it creates convection currents. And at some distance from these um, vents, the, the, the water is reacting with the magma. It bubbles up into these vents and these minerals and hydrogen that's uh, bubbling up will react with very common minerals in the, the crust and the seafloor rock and create a particular kind of rock in these vents. Um, it's a process called serpentization. And uh, these are porous rocks. And if you cut them and look at them under a microscope, they are full of holes, little tiny holes, chambers that are interconnected, and the size of these holes is just about the size of a bacterial cell. And they have very thin walls between them, sometimes semi-permeable, and the walls of these thin walls are filled with iron and sulfur, which are incredibly reactive molecules. And so here we have these stacks, these rocks, with these holes that now can perfectly concentrate any molecules that are gonna be created. And this isn't to say this is how it happened on Earth, but it's so plausible. Both um, you solved the concentration problem, these molecules will get trapped in these interconnected holes by a process that's similar to how when you were in the dryer, your socks always end up in your duvet cover. Like these, it's, uh, there's this bubbling up of, of the minerals, they concentrate the, uh, the, the molecules. And then it solves another major problem um, in biological metabolism, which is that all life that we know of runs on a particular form of redox chemistry to move electrons around, and it uh, uses hydrogen um, gradients in order to create energy. There's no real reason you should have to use hydrogen. It's just what m life actually does. And this system with hydrothermal vents provides a plausible explanation of how you evolve that first system for getting energy using gradients of hydrogen. Uh, it, it, it explains how you get um, reaction using iron sulfur, which again, every single organism on the planet uses Still today, iron sulfur molecules that are embedded in other proteins to do these reactions. And it explains how metabolism could have first evolved without cells, and then how you could first get in the same hydrothermal vent the two initial forms of life. Archaea and bacteria could have evolved in the same hydrothermal vent. You get central metabolism, you have RNA enzymes, and then later they separate then they figure out how to build a cell membrane, which are different in these two clades, and how to do DNA um, replication, which are different in these two clades. But central metabolism is the same. How would you possibly get that in two different organisms before you have a cell membrane? So I don't want to get into the details of all the biochemistry of why the system makes sense, but I find it an amazing, um, plausible explanation for the first time of how life could have evolved on this planet. And it involves incredibly simple um, molecules that are abundant around the universe. And for those Goldilocks planets that are out there that have water and might have plate tectonics, there's no reason to believe that you wouldn't have similar kind of processes. So I think it makes it more likely that out there, there are going to be other life forms on planets that are water-based that could be more similar to us than we might have otherwise imagined. So that was my couple minutes thoughts on the meaning of life.